Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. All right, it's my turn. I picked a story that you might have heard of called The Secret Life of Walter Mitty by James Thurber. It originally appeared in The New Yorker in 1939. That seems very old. Yeah. Did you see the movie? No. Neither did I. I thought about watching it in preparation for this, and then I was like, no. No. <laughs> good, good. I'll probably watch it eventually, though, because when I was searching for a story for my turn, I searched for short stories that were later turned into movies. Oh, And nice. that's how I found this one. Okay. Yeah. I think I'm going to start doing that more often because, um, well, for a lot of reasons. People may have heard of them, but also that's usually like some cream of the crop stuff, you know? Yeah. Especially, I kept thinking about uh, Arrival, which was the name yes. for the movie but the story was called what was the story called hold on wait i forget it's called the story of your life yeah (laughs) i knew it was something like super meta (laughs) anyway that's how i found it and uh i will read a section now when he came out into the street again with the overshoes in a box under his arm, Walter Mitty began to wonder what the other thing was his wife had told him to get. She had told him twice before they set out from their house from Waterbury. In a way, he hated these weekly trips to town. He was always getting something wrong. Kleenex, he thought. Squibs. Razor blades? No. Toothpaste. Toothbrush. Bicarbonate. Carborundum. Initiative and referendum? He gave it up, but she would remember it. Where's that what's-its-name? She would ask. Don't tell me you forgot the what's-its-name. A newsboy went by shouting something about the Waterbury trial. Perhaps this will refresh your memory. The district attorney suddenly thrust a heavy automatic at the quiet figure on the witness stand. Have you ever seen this before? Walter Mitty took the gun and examined it expertly. This is my Webley Vickers 50.80, he said calmly. An excited buzz ran around the courtroom. The judge rapped for order. You are a crack shot with any sort of firearms, I believe, said the district attorney insinuatingly. Objection, shouted Mitty's attorney. We have shown that the defendant could not have fired the shot. We have shown that he wore his right arm in a sling on the night of the 14th of July. Walter Mitty raised his hand briefly and the bickering attorneys were stilled. With any known make of a gun, he said evenly, I could have killed Gregory Fitzhurst at 300 feet with my left hand. Pandemonium broke loose in the courtroom. A woman's scream rose above the bedlam and suddenly a lovely dark-haired girl was in Walter Mitty's arms. <laughs> the district attorney struck at her savagely. Without rising from his chair, Mitty let the man have it on the point of the chin. You miserable cur! I like it. I think I'm going to keep the laughs in too as part of the uh, the reading. You should. Well, okay. So to your earlier question, I had not seen the film. I didn't know what the short story was either. I had no clue. And uh, when you first start reading it, it is, it's this, it's a man going into town with his wife to get a couple things that day. And it is interrupted four or five times uh, by these extremely vivid daydreams that he's having. And they are so yeah. fun. And he is the main character in all of them. And in all of the scenarios you know they're kind of like over the top and he and he's imagining like the best and worst case scenarios of all of them he's a surgeon another one like and he's not even a practice surgeon he just like does a surgery out of the blue anyway when you first start reading it it's like really uh jarring but then when you understand that this is the format and that it's going to happen a couple times it was just so much fun to read and when i read it the first time i was like laughing i was like this is yes this is exactly it and uh poor walter Mitty is regarded by his wife and every passerby in this story as a total airhead. Like they are not appreciating the fact that just because his mind is elsewhere, that it's not complex. They think that he's aloof, but that's not it. He's having wild, imaginative, exciting daydreams and they're extremely lucid. He is just one of these guys that seems like unbothered with the real world and he's having a blast inside his own head. He would love reading you know so he just seems like a fun guy and that's why when i read it i was super into it and i was like oh i can imagine whatever this book might be about or uh, the movie but uh it also kind of starts out or his wife is hinting at like, we need to get you to the doctor again. So not only is he regarded as eccentric, but they're also trying to like medicate him out of it somehow because it is apparently disabling <laughs> in some way. It's not just annoying his wife and it's not just making it hard for him to do shopping. It also seems to be like somehow crippling. Yeah. The story does a great job of setting up two different kind of feelings yeah. The feelings within his daydreams are exciting and, you know, funny. They're outlandish. They're fun. Then the feeling in his normal life is just like this, I don't know, almost put upon. 
Yeah. And a little bit uh, sad, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he like has this moment where he's like, I'm going to go, I'm going to, my wife will be upset if I don't get to the hotel before she does and wait for her. So I'm going to go sit over here so she can find me. Then he's lost in a daydream and she breaks him out of it by saying, why are you sitting over here where I can't find you? <laughs> I've been wandering all over this yeah. stupid hotel looking for you. So those two different emotions kind of clashing together. I didn't pick up on what you were talking about with whether or not he was going to be, whether they're going to treat these daydreams as like a problem. I mean, they're, they're yeah. obviously treated as a problem in certain ways, but not, I didn't, I wasn't taking them as being literally medicated, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe that's not what doctors could have offered, but like, no, I'm not saying you're wrong. Yeah. They're getting professional help. I don't, I don't know. I, I just didn't pick up on that I, for whatever reason. Missed it. So um, the character himself seems like one of these common tropes that we see almost where it's a guy that is bothered by life because whatever he's got going on in his imagination is like so much more exciting. I just love this type of character. And I think uh, this type of character is like probably best brought to life through literature, which we experience as readers in our heads. So we can understand and appreciate a character like this. We can appreciate Walter Mitty because why else would we be reading about other people just to think about it in our head? It's because our minds are extremely powerful. So like someone was giving me shit the other day about like a shirt that I have that says the book was better and they're like referencing some podcast where it was like joe rogan or someone i guess like jokes about how is the book better when the movie is like visually brought to life and it's this spectacle and you can't argue the spectacle of film but you can all day argue like and this is your entire book john so i'm gonna butcher your premise but like the power (laughs) of the mind and bringing fiction to life you know and the power of a written word and conveying these things as strongly as a visual medium can. So Walter Mitty, dude, he's like the literature god. Walter Mitty is having these full-blown experiences in his head. I mean, that is one thing. Obviously, we talked about this before that you can't get from a movie because film is always inherently third person you can only see people on screen you can't hear their thoughts you can't feel their feelings or feel what they're thinking which you can do in prose right in fiction yeah written fiction and getting inside their head is a uh it'd be interesting to see what you know obviously having read the story i would be interested to see how they brought it onto and made it a whole movie it seems so small in this this story like it's it's a concise little situation it's not not a long plot i don't know how you make a 90 minute movie out of it so it'll be interesting yeah. to see what they did with it but you're never going to get that same internal feeling that you get in the story you just can't get it it's just not there on yeah. screen <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we'll have to wait for your book to come out so that, you know, people can understand <laughs> all that you understand about what the brain is doing with these words. So we all fantasize about, you know, somewhat realistic scenarios that we could have been our best selves in. And Walter Mitty is like taking it to the next level, right? He is the protagonist, man. We've all imagined exciting things happening to us. It's just adorable to think for this man, they're debilitating. They're like all consuming. He can't shut it off. Like, this is just a wonderful character. Yeah. I guess it's built into the, um, just the dichotomy of the difference between what's going on in his head and what's going on outside of his head. You know, what he's missing out. Like when he comes back into reality, it's always like, you're screwing things up, Walter. You know, something went wrong again. You're driving too fast. You're, why are you going in that door? Or how uh, he snaps out of one because he remembers the item that his wife told him to buy. And he just says it out loud and somebody uh, makes fun of him for like, did he just say that out loud? That was weird. Did you like it? Had you read this? before i had not read this before no and i did like okay. it. yeah i enjoyed this i mean this is again like the last episode we is not a lot of traditional plot in it you know it's more just outlining like it's just a, he does a couple of things there's a little bit of movement there's kind of i mean if we really squeezed it we could probably say there's a quote-unquote plot sure. but it's less of a story than it is kind of just a presentation of the character you know it's like let's watch this character in action and uh, see what we can observe about him yeah maybe it is just like a kind of a character sketch because they're like you don't even necessarily get the satisfaction of him having or having not completed his tasks for the day like the way it ends is just very much like i think he like gets interrupted but then he like immediately goes through yeah i'm gonna read the end oh the last paragraph is great 
Okay, so this is probably a good example, too, of like, um, we talk a lot about how there's not happy stories in short fiction. They're, they're all sad. And we went on like a long tangent, and I haven't listened to the edited version to see if any of it made it. But we talked at length about why that is, you know, and, you know, what's worth capturing in words? Is it happy things or sad things? Is it like human suffering or is it? Sign up for Patreon right. to get that exclusive clip. <laughs> exactly. Yes. That is a good <laughs> plug. Uh, we're going <laughs> to put all of our ridiculous tangents as bonus content content for the nerds that want to pay us to hear it. So uh, yeah, support. But what is surprising to me is that to those points, this is, I would argue like a happy story is a fun story. And I'm still smitten with the character in a way that I don't find myself usually smitten with characters in those types of stories when I rarely read them. But I think maybe like... I, and I'll read this paragraph. I know I'm rambling, but there is something tragic about Walter Mitty in that like he's not appreciated or that he's like constricted, right? And so that's why this like ending paragraph like feels powerful to me. Like it's a happy story in that like he's going to keep doing this and we know that he's not going to get like beaten down by the world, but he doesn't fit, you know? So there's something odd about him that is endearing in a way that's not just like good things happening to good people. We don't like those stories. So here's the <laughs> last, <laughs> nobody like, nobody fucking likes those stories. It's like when your hot friend tells you that she married a hot guy guy and uh, makes a lot of money. It's like, uh, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody needs a hero like that. So here's the last paragraph of the story. It says, they went out through the revolving doors that made a faintly derisive whistling sound when you push them. It was two blocks to the parking lot. At the drugstore on the corner, she said, wait here for me. I forgot something. I won't be a minute. She was more than a minute. Walter Mitty lighted a cigarette. It began to rain. Rain was sleet in it. He stood up against the wall of the drugstore, smoking. He put his shoulders back and his heels together. To hell with the handkerchief, said Walter Mitty scornfully. He took one last drag on the cigarette and snapped it away. Then, with that faint, fleeting smile playing about his lips, he faced the firing squad, erect and motionless, proud and disdainful, Walter Mitty, the undefeated, inscrutable to the last. So, okay, this is my favorite because there's like the least amount of context here, right? Like in the other instances, like somebody mentions the trial and then he imagines himself on trial. Like there's these like things that are happening in real life that he can like directly correlate to a daydream. And here it was just like such a good example of how little material he needs to go into that world because he's just waiting for his wife smoking a cigarette against a wall and he thinks firing squad and he thinks defiant, you know, death row man. And he <laughs> like he just can't help it it's adorable he also reminds me of like an adult version of Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes mm. constantly Good. Yeah. constantly imagination imagining things we love Calvin as a kid and his imagination and because he's also a thoughtful person you know and there's a lot of poignant moments in that strip but the kid gets away with it because he's a kid like this is Walter Mitty he's an adult he can't get away with it anymore but that doesn't mean that like what he's imagining is, is any less powerful I do like what you said about him being like a, what do you, I forget how you phrase it but like like being the literary man or something, you know, the one who is inventing things in his head, which is what we get from literature is an invented experience purely in your head. Yeah. And obviously I like that because it feeds right into the theme of everything I, I work towards, right? Right. Writing fiction and then literary cognition. Just having that literary imagination, telling stories as he's moving through life feels eminently human. I did not read this as a person who was suffering from anything. Like yeah. I, I said before, like I missed whatever the thing you said about the doctor where you read, like going back to the doctor, I just didn't connect it with anything that was going on as far as these daydreams. I just kind of took him as a, uh, just an imaginative guy, not imaginative guy suffering from over imagination. If, if that's a suffering, it doesn't seem to be to me. At least I wouldn't. I wouldn't think it would be. So I just kind of read him as this guy with a good imagination who lets himself get lost in it every once in a while. Primarily, I feel like as a way to escape from a. Uh, yeah. A uh, humdrum existence, you know, like an existence he's not really into. Like at the end, the ending part, you know, it's he's waiting to like, wait here for me. I forgot something. It won't be a minute. She was more than a minute. He doesn't want to wait there for very long. She's going to take advantage of him by making him wait more than a minute, even though she promised not yeah. to. And he's just like, well, this is I'm just going to make the most of it. I'm going to get into my imagination again. Right. So that's how I, I read him as just this kind of escape artist, if you will, from reality. He has that capacity 
capacity to to enjoy every moment rather than get caught in it. Yeah, escape is a good word. And I don't know that I said it, but yeah, that's exactly what he's doing, you know, like, and he could be an alcoholic. Like we all, we all escape. <laughs> that's right. So you're, you're right. Like it's harmless and, and he's not necessarily suffering from anything. I mean, I would like him to get a new life situation. I don't think he's in the best <laughs> situation in his life however right. he might accomplish that but i do i don't think his capacity to imagine himself in all these alternate situations is a problem for him it seems more of a yeah a help for him which is the same thing that literature is in general reading stories and enjoying stories is, is helpful it's a human experience it's useful and good it's not a problem right and maybe that's my point of view but <laughs> yeah keep, keep <laughs> telling yourself it's not a problem <laughs> <laughs> it's not a problem it's not a problem <laughs> just one more story just one more story <laughs> So, but you liked him as a character. Absolutely. Yeah. There's so many different scenarios he puts himself into, you know, I did like that yeah. everything. There was that recurring uh, pocket, a pocket, a pocket. There's always this thing making a pocket, okay, a pocket, yeah, yeah, a pocket yeah. of sound. That was on my notes. Yeah. So there's like themes or something. And I, I was waiting for that to come back as like something. I didn't know what it was going to wind up being, if anything, apparently it didn't seem to resolve as anything, but you know, as I'm projecting from the middle of the story towards the end, I'm like, is he going to wake up somewhere where there's just a, yeah, he's a like in sound. some room and then he's hearing that sound right. over and over again but that's not what happened yeah i underlined it immediately on, on first reference because it's in that first paragraph and i underlined it because this is one of those devices that we all learn about so frequently in uh english classes growing up that you think that <laughs> it's gonna be like exclusively used in language because it's onomatopoeia right yeah yeah. Okay. So when I read this and I saw that, you know, I immediately recognized it as one of these kind of fun devices that I couldn't tell you the last time I read in a short piece of fiction. Yeah. It's almost as if because they're hammered so much that we dismiss them as legitimate art forms. We can all like describe a sound probably. And there's something uh, simple and basic about it because we have been doing it since we were little. And then when I read it here, it definitely like evoked the same like playfulness of that, you know, time in my life life where that kind of language could be exciting and fun for a kid to read but to see it in short fiction i was like okay first of all this is like it's just fun like the whole tone of the story is fun and onomatopoeia is fun and my takeaway as soon as i saw this was use onomatopoeia <laughs> <laughs> i was like i don't think that i want to tell people to write a sh uh, good uh, a happy short story and i don't want to tell people to write about a character that has blah 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 whatever but the onomatopoeia i was like that is a quick takeaway you can easily do it tomorrow and it's probably there's probably a perfect spot for it in like every story you've ever written you know you don't have yeah. to use yeah. it but it just adds this like richness to your language that's a good one it's a good takeaway you're right we don't see that enough and this was well done as far as like capturing what the sound probably sounded like yeah well i read it out loud and i was like oh like i could see that i could see uh th this like kind of motor like chugging along like gaining momentum it's like pocket -a, pocket -a, pocket -a, pocket -a. yeah yeah it's cool my takeaway, I don't really have a good clear takeaway beyond just that mixing of real and imagined, which is what the story is. It's like getting into the head of a character, which is, it seems like a pretty lame takeaway for this story. Get into your character's head. Okay. <laughs> 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 I just like the way that the imagined scenarios arose from the action that he was taking. Things triggered. It, it was triggered off of what was happening, you know. And the last paragraph is the is a, such a good example where he's smoking, and then he yeah, a very clear image of the guy in front of a firing squad smoking his last cigarette. We've all seen some representation of that image, right? But every scenario arises from something specific, something concrete within what he's doing. Right. It's not a good takeaway. Fine. I don't know what to do with it. Listen, we've we've established that we've run out of takeaways. And if we haven't run out, that we are repeating ourselves. That's right. But all of our takeaways have been done. And all of these stories are hitting on like the same good things over and over. But I guess the point of doing this podcast over and over and over is just kind of like not every story resonates with you as a writer. So maybe Walter Mitty is the one that's going to hammer home the idea of being in a character's head this way, right? Maybe this is what is going to click for you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I could take away other 
things from this too. Like, you know, it doesn't have to be a full story. It doesn't have to be a plot driven story. This, can, this is a vignette that captures the essence of a character. You know, it's not, it's not a character struggling with a problem that would create a, what we would define as a traditional story where they have to make a choice. It's just a little scene in which we learn who this character is. And by learning who this character is, we, yeah. we get an appreciation for him and we get a satisfying journey through the story, through the writing. And that's something I've taken away from many other stories too, or many other pieces of writing that at the end, I'm like, this isn't quite a story, but it's so good. I can learn that I don't need to tell a story. It's my next piece of writing. Wow. The JC I know would be quaking in his boots hearing that, but yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like there's, yeah, there's just certain versions of whatever this is that it's going to hit home for you. So mm-hmm. there's definitely stories that like I remember better. So even if like I learned something in reading them in the moment, like Walter Mitty is one that I know I'll remember because it's oh, so yeah. vivid. So like, yeah, maybe you need to listen to a thousand episodes of the podcast but you only remember one example when we talk about like second person you know what i mean yeah all right well thanks guys if you enjoyed this episode consider joining our patreon your support helps us keep the show running find out more at patreon.com slash why is this good podcast and for industry news writing tips and great short fiction join our facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash naples writers workshop You can also subscribe to our monthly newsletter at napleswritersworkshop.com.